Hunstroff from Caltech, uh, who will tell us about space transitions in hyperbolic spaces. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. So I'm told I'm not to. Um, okay, so I want to tell you about phase transitions in hyperbolic spaces, but to start with, let's just talk about what do I mean by a phase transition as a mathematician. So generally the picture is as follows. You have some kind of large system that has many microscopic constituents that interact with each other in some way, possibly with some spatial structure, like things interact with their neighbors, but perhaps not. Okay, and the system is going to be described by some parameters which determine the interactions between these microscopic constituents. And these are parameters like perhaps the temperature or the pressure or something like that. Often the temperature is the most natural one to think about, mm. are things that can be varied continuously. Okay, and a phase transition occurs when varying this parameter through some special value causes some kind of abrupt qualitative, perhaps discontinuous change in the behavior of the system. Okay. So of course, you know, we're all familiar with phase transitions through our everyday lives, you know, things like when you boil water and it changes from liquid to gas and things like that. But in fact, there are many, many more phase transitions that we're less familiar with. And in fact, we now understand that it's quite a generic behavior of large complex systems to undergo phase transitions. It's a very kind of typical thing. So in addition to solid liquid gas phase transitions, there are also transitions in, in magnets. Like if you have a block of iron, its magnetic properties are different at room temperature and when it's very hot in qualitatively different ways. And of course, there are many phase transitions that have nothing to do with physics as well. So you know, traffic jams, things like that might be thought of in this kind of uh, way. And um, for example, the spread of a disease through a population also is something that undergoes a phase transition. Uh, and uh, there are also, you know, phase transitions in the average case complexity of combinatorial optimization problems and things like that. This is really a very generic thing that happens in these large complex systems. And moreover, the underlying mathematics uh, that, that governs these phase transitions has a lot in common throughout these diverse areas. And studying phase transitions leads to kind of interesting questions of a pure mathematical nature, which are kind of complementary to these uh, practical origins in, in applied problems. Now, not only do many systems undergo phase transitions, but also many systems exhibit interesting critical phenomena. So what this means is if you take this parameter and you tune it to exactly the point where the phase transition occurs, you often see a very rich mathematical structure emerging that also often has all kinds of associated fractal geometry and stuff like that. So I should say this doesn't always happen. Sometimes you get, it, this, this is something that happens in what are called continuous space transitions. So actually the, the ones we're most familiar with like water boiling uh, is, is a discontinuous space transition usually, and it doesn't really have this interesting fractal structure, but many other things do. Uh, and one I'll talk about in detail today is percolation. Um, so this is actually a simulation of percolation that was done by Jason Miller. And you know you see this critical percolation and there are all these interesting fractal boundaries between different large clusters. Um, so generally the story with these critical phenomena, and I'll say a lot more about this later, is that we understand this pretty well in two dimensions. Or more accurately, there are a small number of models that we understand extremely well now in two dimensions. And this is you know, closely related to what uh, Ewan and Greg do. And we also understand things in high dimensions. And then the story in intermediate dimensions, so especially three dimensions, is generally very poorly understood. It's very much at the frontier of, or perhaps beyond the frontier of modern research. Okay. So as I mentioned briefly before, um, what I mostly want to tell you about today is percolation. So percolation is perhaps the simplest to define mathematical model of a system undergoing a phase transition. Of course, being simple to define is not the same thing as being simple to study. So the way this works is you start with some graph, which here is the square grid. 
and then you independently choose to either keep or delete each edge of the graph independently at random with some prob probability p, which is our parameter we're going to vary to see a phase transition. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the standard sort of jargon of the field is that the edges that we keep are referred to as open and the edges that we delete are referred to as closed. Okay. And uh, generally what we're interested in is the geometry of the clusters, so with, by which I mean the connected components of the random subgraph that's left after you perform this random deletion of edges. So the interesting thing about this model, which really leads to all, most of the further interesting questions is that it does undergo a phase transition, at least when you're not one dimensional. So for most infinite graphs, in some sense, if they're not one dimensional, you see a phase transition. So PC is strictly between zero and one. What's the definition of PC? So this is the critical probability. PC is defined to be the infimal value of P, where the probability the origin belongs to an infinite cluster is positive. In other words, when you're below PC, the model is translation invariant. So every vertex has the same probability of belonging to an infinite cluster. When you're below PC, there are no infinite clusters. When you're above PC, there is an infinite cluster almost surely. This existence of an infinite cluster is always a zero one event by a uh, common zero. Okay, and um, so one of the famous early landmark results in the theory of population due to Harry Preston in the 80s, who proved that for this specific example, so uh, population on the square grid, the critical probability is exactly equal to a half. And this is related to the fact that the dual of the square grid is the square grid. Okay, so this is very nice and it's the starting point of many of the deep analyses of population on the square grid. But if we're going to look at other kinds of graphs, as we will do later in the talk, um, there's a danger that you'll find this misleading because in most examples, we, there's no hope of exactly determining what PC is. So for example, on the 3D lattice, you know, you can try and estimate it numerically, but there's no reason to believe that it has any nice expression. It's probably a transcendental number. Okay. So um, once we get started in the theory of percolation and we know that a phase transition occurs, there are, you know, a few big questions you'd like to answer. So let, let's focus on two. So the first is, what more can I say about this phase transition? So the basic quality, the first basic qualitative question is, well, by definition, when I'm below PC, there are no infinite clusters. And when I'm above PC, there are infinite clusters. So you can ask, well, which of these phases does PC itself belong to? Okay. And the general conjecture is that at very large generality, there should not be any infinite clusters at, the, at criticality. Um, but this is completely open, for example, for three dimensional lattices. So for two dimensions and high dimensions, it's known, but intermediate dimensions, it's a really big open problem. But ideally, we'd like to prove that there are no infinite clusters at PC. And then really what we'd like to do is to go a lot further and say, okay, all the clusters are finite, but they're kind of big in some sense, they have heavy tailed, it's not too unlikely for them to be really large, and they should have all kinds of interesting fractal geometry that we'd like to understand. Okay, and this fractal geometry is going to be captured in part by what are called critical exponents, which I'll talk about more later. Okay, so that's one kind of direction we might go in this study, trying to understand the behavior of the model at critical. Okay, a different question is, well, I know that when I'm above PC, the infinite clusters exist, right? That's just the definition. So, you know, basic question is, well, is there just one of them or are there five or are they infinitely many, right? And this is another thing you'd like to okay. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to restrict attention to transitive graphs. That means, uh, so I'll also assume my graphs are connected and locally finite, which means all the degrees are finite. Uh, I, every vertex has finite with many edges instead to it. And I'll also assume they're transitive, which means that all the vertices look the same. In other words, I can map any vertex to any other vertex by a symmetry of the graph, which are, you know, in particular, these kind of integer lattices will always have this problem. Okay, so I want to start by talking about the second question, and then we'll see actually that it is closely related to the first question. 
So again, the question is to understand when I'm in, so when you're above PC, that's called supercritical percolation. And I want to understand in supercritical percolation, how many infinite clusters do I have? So the most general kind of basic qualitative picture that always holds in transcript setting was uh, proven by first by so parts of it by Newman and Shulman in the early 80s, then Hagstrom, Perez, and Shulman in the late 90s. So they showed that in general, you have most of these three phases in this order, but, but some of these could be degenerate and, and be empty. So they show, okay, so first, when I'm between zero and PC, I have no infinite clusters. That's just by definition. Okay. And then the supercritical phase possibly splits into two phases, where first I have infinitely many infinite clusters, and then I have one infinite cluster. Okay, so again, this, this theorem doesn't tell you that these phases are non empty. So it could be that I immediately go from zero to one. In fact, that is what happens on the square grid, for example. And it could be that I never have this uniqueness phase at the end except for one. And of course, it also doesn't tell you at all what happens at these, um, at these transition points. Uh, but this is actually not at all an obvious theorem because having a unique infinite cluster is not a monotone property in the subgraph, right? As I increase P, potentially I could birth a new infinite cluster somewhere else that just doesn't join up to what I already have. But what they show is, although it's not monotone, you do have this monotonicity. Once you have a unique infinite cluster, you always have a unique infinite cluster at every larger value of P. Uh, and the Newman Shulman showed that you can't have a number which is not zero, uh, one or infinite, zero, one or infinite. Now, in this traditional setting of Euclidean lattices, this problem of uniqueness has been understood for a long time, in fact, since the 80s. Um, so this was settled uh, first by Isaac Newman in 1987, and then with a much slicker and more general proof by Burton a couple of years later. So the Isaac Heston Newman proof has kind of come back in a big way recently because it gives much stronger quantitative outputs. Um, so what they prove is that on the Euclidean lattice, there's always at most one infinite cluster. So in particular, you, you know, PC is equal to PU, this, this potential intermediate phase doesn't exist. And the proof of this, the, the Burton and Keene proof is, is really elegant and it's you know, become one of the real classic proofs in, in this area. Basically, so let me very briefly explain the idea of it to you now. So first, what they argue is that if you have multiple infinite clusters, then the origin must have a positive probability to be like this. This is what they call a trifurcation point. So in other words, the origin belongs to an infinite cluster. And if you delete the origin, it splits that infinite cluster into three infinite pieces, at least three infinite pieces. Okay. So this is by some kind of surgery. You know, if you had multiple infinite clusters, you could make some paths to make them come and join at one point. Um, so then, because the model's translation invariant, every point must have the same probability to be one of these trifurcation points. So that means if you take a big box, if you just look how many trifurcation points are there in expectation, well, it's just the volume of the box times whatever this probability is. So it scales you know, uh, linearly in the volume of the box. But then what they say is, if I look at all these trifurcation points, um, there's a combinatorial argument, which says that the number of distinct paths going to infinity off, uh, from the box to infinity inside the percolation cluster is at least the number of trifurcation points inside the box, right? This is just a kind of combinatorial uh, fact, okay? But then, you know, the number of these of disjoint paths that you can take going to infinity off the box is at most the size of the boundary of the box, right? And these two things have different scaling, right? The boundary of a box scales like n to the d minus one, whereas the volume of the box scales like n to the d, right? So this linear scaling being at least uh, the size of the boundary, uh, um, and it just doesn't make sense, right? You take n to infinity, you get a contradiction. Okay, and that, that's how the button works. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Are we Thinking about uh, families of finite size graphs or just finite size graphs? Um, I'm going to be thinking about infinite graphs 
you can also do percolation on families of finite graphs. It actually turns out to be generally more difficult to do that. The theory is much cleaner and more exciting. Um, okay. So this proof of Burton and Keene, it actually generalizes not, not just to these Euclidean lattices, but actually to any amenable transitive graph. Okay. So if, um, you know, if anyone's worked in kind of geometric group theory or anything like that, you'll know that if you have a, let's say a group and you have its Cayley graphs, whether the group is amenable or non-amenable is kind of, in some sense, the most basic important thing that you could know about. And amenability has a huge diverse number of equivalent formulations. So first was introduced by von Neumann in work related to like operator algebras and stuff like that and quantum mechanics. But you know, it it's, can be thought of as a simple geometric thing as well in terms of, of the geometry of, of graphs. So we say that for any graph, we can define its Chiga constant to be this infinite where we look over all finite sets of vertices and we look at the ratio of the number of edges and the boundary of the set to the basically the volume of the set, which we're writing in this edge way as the edges, number of edges with both endpoints of the set. And if this infimum is positive, we say that the graph is non amenable, and if it's zero, it's amenable. So, in other words, in amenable graphs, we can find large sets where the ratio of the size of the boundary to the volume is arbitrarily small. Okay, so for example, Euclidean lattices are amenable because if I take a big box, right, the bound, size of the boundary grows slower than the volume of the box. Okay, on the other hand, a simple example of a non amenable graph is the three regular tree. So it's not too hard to see that if you take any finite set of vertices in the three regular tree, its boundary is of the same order as this point. Okay, so one of the biggest conjectures in this area due to Benjamin and Tram, who conjectured that the converse of the Burton keene theorem is also true. So Burton and Keene proved that if you have any amenable transitive graph, then it does not have a phase where there are infinitely many clusters. What they conjectured is that on every non-amenable transitive graph, there should be a phase where you get infinitely many infinite clusters. So, um, you know, for a tree, this is very easy because in fact, PU is equal to one on the tree. So you'll get, so on a three regular tree, PC is a half, uh, and then all the way from a half to one, you'll get infinitely many infinite clusters. You never get a unique infinite cluster unless P is actually equal to one, okay? But there are examples where you actually get all three phases. So one is given by tessellations of the hyperbolic plane. So on this graph, okay, it's not so easy to prove these things, but it's, it's not, impossibly difficult either. You can show you really have all three phases, where first you have no infinite clusters, then you have infinitely many, then you have one. So let me quickly review what's been done on this problem before. So really the first serious work on this problem, actually before the general conjecture was formulated, was by Grimm and Newman in 1990. They looked at the product of a tree with a Euclidean lattice. And they proved that if the tree has very large degree, then, then this conjecture is true that you have a non uniqueness phase. And in fact, in this example, you have again all three phases. Um, after the general conjecture was proven, most of the early work was in the same, similar kind of vein in doing what uh, I call a perturbative proof. So, in other words, you know, the conjecture is about non amenable graphs. But if you assume instead of just non-amenability that your graphs are like very non-amenable in some appropriate sense, then you can start trying to attack the conjecture in combinatorial ways, you know, counting paths and possible interfaces and stuff like that, and give some uh, proofs of the conditional proofs of the conjecture for graphs that maybe instead of the Chiga constant being positive, it's like close to as large as it could be or something like that. So there's a bunch of works in this vein, perhaps the most significant is by Pack and Smonova Nagnabeda, who showed that in particular that every non amenable group has at least one Cayley graph where the conjecture is true. Okay. So, aside from that perturbative thing, there are really two, two major kind of non perturbative things that aren't assuming some very strong form of non amenability. 
So first of all, the planar case is now has been completely understood for quite a long time, first by Chicago's own Steve Lally in the late 90s, and then in full generality by Benjamini and Schramm a few years later. Uh, so it's known completely generally for planar non amenable graphs that they have this have PC less than U. And here are the arguments you have planar duality to play around with topological arguments. And this is really quite a special set. Um, somewhat more recently, I won't get into what this means, but Russ Lyons proved that any group that has cost bigger than one has PC less than PU for all of its Kelly graphs. So I don't want to say what this means because it's kind of like an ergodic theoretic condition on the graph. Um, but what these two things tell you together in particular is that anything, any graph, any transitive graph that kind of looks like the hyperbolic plane is going to have PC less than PU. So this, this theorem of lines in particular covers like non planar graphs that look roughly like the hyperbolic plane. Okay. But in particular, <laughs> I should say this before I go to my theorem, so pretend you didn't see that. One thing that you know isn't treated by these is higher dimensional hyperbolic spaces. For example, you have like a, a lattice in three-dimensional hyperbolic space rather than two-dimensional. These theorems do not apply, unless, of course, it you know it has is highly non-amenable and then you can see the result. Um, so the, the main thing I want to tell you about today, or you know, the newish work I want to tell you about, uh, is that the conjecture is true for every transitive hyperbolic graph. Okay, so this is or Gromov of hyperbolic more accurately. So Gromov of hyperbolicity is an extremely you know, important thing that comes up all over the place, you know, especially in sort of geometric group theory and things like that. And you can think of it as a coarse version of saying that the graph is negatively curved. Okay, so there's, there's a few equivalent definitions. The, um, the simplest one is called the Ritz triangle condition. And basically what Gromov of hyperbolicity says in this formulation is that every geodesic triangle kind of looks has this pinch shape where it looks approximately like a tripod. So in other words, there's some constant, which is traditionally denoted delta, but you shouldn't think of it being small, uh, such that if you take any three points and any geodesics between them like this, then any side is contained in the constant size, the delta neighborhood of the other two sides, right? where delta is a parameter that goes into the definition. So for example, trees are gram of hyperbolic with delta equals zero, because every geodesic triangle is exactly a tripod, right? Whereas if you look in the hyperbolic plane, geodesic triangles aren't literally these tripod shapes, but they're very close to it. They will pinch in to the middle so that they have this problem. Okay. And Gromov of hyperbolicity also holds for higher dimensional hyperbolic spaces. So for example, I have this 3D hyperbolic space taken from Wikipedia. Okay, so I, uh, I'm not going to tell you about the proof yet. So I want to take a step back and look at this other question about understanding the critical behavior. And we'll see that this is actually, these two questions really go hand in hand. Okay, so let's recall these questions that I mentioned earlier. So the first one is the most basic qualitative question. Do you have infinite clusters of criticality or not? Now, as I said before, we believe that in great generality, you do not have infinite clusters of criticality. And moreover, we'd like to go further than this and try to understand what the distribution of, uh, it should be the case that finite clusters of criticality are kind of big in an interesting way. And we'd like to understand the distribution. Okay. And one of the most important ways for understanding this is through what we call critical exponents. So basically the idea is that at criticality, if you look at sort of, probabilities of clusters being large in various senses, these should have power law decays. Uh, and these exponents are called critical exponents. And similarly, if you look near criticality, and maybe you have something that blows up as you approach criticality, you often expect interesting quantities to blow up like powers of how close you are, or, or things that decay as you go to criticality. So the, um, the three that I'll focus on now, uh, let me just focus on the last two actually. Uh, so the, if you look at the probability that the cluster at the origin, which I'll always denote by C, is bigger than N, this should decay like some power of N, right? It might not be an exact power. Sometimes there are logs, but it's roughly going to be like some power of N. Um, 
Another quantity that's really important is this, which is called the susceptibility. So this is just the expected size of the cluster of the origin. Okay, so it's an important theorem called the sharpness of the phase transition, that this is finite exactly when you're below PC. And we expect it to blow up like some power of epsilon when you're at PC minus epsilon. So one situation where you can understand these things very explicitly and that you could even like teach in, you know, first undergraduate course in probability if, if you wanted to would be is uh, on trees, because population on trees is the same thing as branching processes, which are an extremely classical thing in probability. So you could, so in particular, you can compute all these uh, critical exponents and so on, you find that they have these simple values. Okay, now what about on Euclidean lattice? So here the story becomes much more interesting. Um, so this is kind of a partly conjectural picture that people have been working over the last you know, 40 years or so to fill in parts of rigorous. So first of all, what should happen is once you're in sufficiently high dimensions, the lattice is so spacious that the model just doesn't realize that it's not on the tree in some sense. And it doesn't feel the geometric effects of the lattice, and we expect the critical behavior to be exact, actually exactly the same on the high dimensional lattice as it is on the tree. Right? And you might find this surprising. You might think, okay, maybe the behavior is going to like converge to the infinite dimensional tree behavior as the dimension goes to infinity, but that's not what happens. It exactly stabilizes at this behavior. This is called mean field behavior once you get in percolation into at least seven dimensions. And this is a very kind of general phenomenon in statistical mechanics, where models will have an upper critical dimension, where their behavior kind of trivializes above this dimension, and it's more interesting below the dimension. And for percolation, this is essentially known, this high dimensional thing, uh, due to you know, milestone work of Hara and Slade in 1990. So there are still some things that we don't quite understand as much as we'd like. Uh, so, so actually, if you look at the nearest neighbor model, like the most obvious one that I've been talking about, you currently need the dimension to be at least 11, and there's like computer-assisted proofs and stuff like that. It's a bit of a mess. Uh, but if you if you look at lattices where you're allowed, instead of doing nearest neighbor, you connect everything within distance a million or something, then you can get it all the way down to seven dimensions, which should be the right thing for nearest neighbor as well. So how the higher dimension you are, the easier things get for this method. Um, so that's the high dimensional picture. Now, what's supposed to happen once you go below? So the upper critical dimension for percolation is supposed to be six. So you should think of this as D strictly larger than six rather than D at least seven. Once you go below the upper critical dimension, the geometry of the lattice should really constrain the model in a non-trivial way. So it really starts acting in a genuinely different way to how it does in high dimensions. So for example, in percolation, so in two dimensions, all the exponents take different values in low dimension. And for 2D, these are actually understood at least. Uh, so there are conjectured values that come through kind of conformal field theory and stuff like that. And you see that they have these weird rational exponents, as I, as I put it. And, and this is you know, something that um, uh, Greg and Ewan have contributed a lot to the, uh, the theory of. And this is at least well understood for site percolation on the triangle lattice, which has some special miraculous properties that let the proofs go through. But these things are supposed to hold universally for um, all kinds of planar percolation. Okay. Now, on the other hand, for say dimensions three, four, five, really nobody knows how to understand anything. There's, the exponent should be different than in both cases. But you know, even the physicists heuristically you don't really know how to compute them. You know, the heuristic physics arguments can maybe give you a few decimal places, and even getting like one more decimal place is you know a significant advance, even in the heuristic theory. And so this is something that's very poorly understood. In six dimensions itself, what you expect is that you, the model does feel that it's on a finite dimensional lattice, but only in this like marginal way. And this mean field behavior should hold up to kind of polylogarithmic corrections. But again, this is something that's very far from being understood rigorously. Um, so one way you might like to think of what's going on and what's causing the difference in behavior in low dimensions and high dimensions is that 
uh, in high dimensions, large cycles do not play a significant role in the geometry of critical clusters, whereas in, say, two dimensions, they do. So, for example, if you take a, the cluster of the origin in high dimensions at criticality, so it's finite almost surely, but you can imagine conditioning on it being very large. And what you should see, although this is not proven yet, is this object, which is called the continuum random tree, which was introduced by uh, Aldous in the 90s, maybe. <laughs> supposed to be a very general lim limiting uh, object for these high dimensional models that has sort of this nice spherical structure, but in particular it's a tree. So, you know, it's not that the model itself in the finite dimensional setting is literally, it, it, on the lattice, of course, it does have cycles, but these cycles should not be significant to the large scale geometry and they should kind of vanish in the limit. On the other hand, if you look at large clusters in two dimensions, you know, it's completely different. The, the self-intersections of the cluster on itself really play a significant role in the geometry, even at large scales. And this is related to why the critical exponents come out differently. Okay, so that's kind of the story for um, Euclidean graphs. But you know, my talk is not really about this, it's about hyperbolic stuff, which really is infinite dimensional from the perspective of this theory. Okay. And, um, in the setting, or in fact, for general non-amenable transitive graphs, a, a lot more is understood, although there are a lot of things that we don't, that we still don't understand. So in particular, the basic qualitative question of whether or not you have infinite clusters at criticality is now completely understood in this infinite dimensional setting. So the first big result here was by Benjamin Lyons, Paris and Schramm in 99, and they showed that if under this additional assumption of unimodularity, I don't want to get into what that means, but it holds in most examples, in particular any KD graph of the group, you do not have infinite clusters that you see in the non nimble case. Okay, and since then we've shown more generally, so Timar did some stuff about non unimodular, non amenable transitive graphs, and then using these results uh, during my PhD, I showed that if, in fact, if you have any transitive graph of exponential volume growth, which is a bit weaker than non-amenability, that's already enough to have no infinite clusters of PC. And in fact, in later joint work with Jonathan Herman, we were even able to extend this to some transitive graphs of intermediate growth, which means faster than polynomial, but slower than exponential. Okay. I should say when I mean exponential volume growth, I mean, if you take the balls in the K graph, then the number of points as a function of the radius is growing, like, or whatever. Okay. So this is nice. This basic qualitative picture is now well understood in the setting. We know that there are no infinite clusters of criticality. Okay, but what we'd really like to prove is that you have, you know, these are like, this is an infinite dimensional setting. You ought to have this mean field critical behavior. And this is still open. And, and it's really annoying because this condition, like non-amenability, should be way, way, way in excess of what you need to prove this, right? It should be that as soon as you have like, n to the seven volume growth, at least you should have this. So here we have exponential volume growth, non-immutability, which is stronger, you know, but we still don't know how to prove this in general. So the, the best, you know, unconditional result that applies to like all non-immutable graphs is just that you have some power law bounds on these quantities, but with the wrong exponents. Um, more recently, we've done similar things for some other models. This, in general, is very open. Okay, and we'll see later that proving mean field behavior, critical behavior for non-amenable transitive graphs is actually very closely related to the problem of proving the, the existence of the non-uniqueness phase, i.e. proving that PC is smaller than PC. Okay. So what I want to do next is start to give you some flavor of like, what do the proofs look like in this area? And, you know, you might think if you haven't worked in population before and statistical mechanics before that, you know, this is kind of a combinatorial model. I have a graph, I'm like, you know, randomly deleting edges independently. Maybe I'll try and do some kind of counting argument, like count paths or counting spaces, stuff like that. It turns out that these arguments don't work very well. You know, they're, they're good if you want to understand 
percolation when say p is very close to zero or close to one like if you just want to prove that you have both phases like pc is between zero and one something like that but if you want to understand actual critical percolation these combinatorial arguments don't tend to work very well and you know part of the problem is that we don't know what pc is usually and it's not something you can really hope to compute so you have to work with things that are better suited to just this implicit definition of it being the place where you get infinite clusters. Okay. So one of the main tools for working with these kind of this fact that it's only an implicit definition is by using differential inequality. So the most important ones usually involve again what this is what's called the susceptibility, which is just the expected size of the cluster at the origin. So again, it's an important theorem that I already mentioned that this is finite if and only if p is less than pc. Okay. So often, if you, for example, if you want to prove mean field critical behavior, part of that behavior is that the susceptibility is supposed to blow up like one over epsilon if you're at pc minus epsilon. And um, that proving that that is how it blows up is usually the most important first step in establishing mean field critical behavior. So the nice thing, one nice thing about this is that the derivative of the susceptibility has a nice kind of geometric interpretation, which is written here. So what this says is that there's some slight cheating going on here, but let's ignore it. But the derivative of the susceptibility is as follows. So I fix an edge of my graph, and I look at the clusters at the two endpoints of the edge. Okay, let's call them C1 and C2. Now, of course, the endpoints of this edge might be connected to each other, in a particular one way if that's happening, be just for the edge to be open. And then they'll be the same. But the derivative of the susceptibility is basically the same thing as the expectation of the product of the volumes of these two clusters, given that they're different, or on the indicator that they're different. So this has some nice consequences straight away. So for one thing, one easy inequality is that the derivative of the susceptibility is always bounded by the square of the susceptibility up to a constant. And the reason why that is is, well, you know, these two clusters, you know, if I, if I explore one and find that it's large, it makes it harder for the other one to be large if they're not allowed to be the same, right? It's like I'm removing some of the space that's available for the second one to grow. So you can show that this expectation with this indicator is bounded by if, I, if they were just independent, okay? So you get this differential inequality, and if you integrate this, you know, you do a bit of calculus, what you learn is that the susceptibility always has to blow up at least like one over epsilon. Okay, and this is just on every transitive graph. So usually if you want to, you're in high dimensions and you want to prove that mean field critical behavior holds, the main step is usually to prove the reverse inequality, that the derivative susceptibility is at least its square. Because again, doing a bit of calculus, you get the reverse inequality here. You get that it blows up at most like one over epsilon as you approach PC. Okay. Now, um, usually the way this is done is using a sufficient condition for mean field critical behavior that was introduced by Eisenman and Newman in the 80s called the triangle condition. So what they say is they say, you know, fix a vertex X to be the origin. So. And then sum over all vertices y and z of, the, of this product of the three connection problems. So x connected to y, y connected to z, z connected to x. And just to stress, this is really a product of probabilities of non independent events. It's not a probability of the intersection of three events. Okay. And what they show is that if this quantity is finite at PC, then you can prove this reverse differential inequality. And ultimately, through the work of several other people as well, you can kind of prove most things you want to prove about mean field critical behavior. Okay. And this work I mentioned earlier of Hara and Slade, they exactly show that the triangle, this triangle sum is finite at criticality in large dimensions. So, of course, in our setting, the non amenable world, again, we, everything is kind of infinite dimensional from this standpoint. So we certainly expect this condition to hold for on non amenable graphs, and this would imply um, mean field criticality. Okay, again, this is not something we now have to do. But, but in fact, the same proof that I will tell you a little bit about how we 
solve the non-uniqueness problem by polygraphs, it also tells you that you have made full critical rate. And in fact, um, an important part of the paper is to formulate a new conjecture, which actually implies both conjectures and is stronger and it's kind of easier to think about in some ways. Okay, and it's going to be, this con new conjecture is going to be formulated in terms of operating on. So let's suppose I have my graph. It has this countable vertex set B, which is infinite. Uh, I can, although it's for some reason not very common in, in that, you can always consider matrices over countable sets of those. And they always have well-defined operators. So of course, not every matrix defines an operator on L2 at the vertex set, but that just means that it's operator normal come out as infinite. Okay, so you can always define, so M in two to two means the operator norm of the matrix thought of as an operator from L2 to L2. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at these connection probabilities in percolation, and we're going to think of these as a matrix. Okay, and the new conjecture is that if you define P22 to be the supreme, if you're on a non amenable transfer graph, you define P22 to be the supremal value of P where this operates norm is finite, then this should be strictly larger than PC. Okay, so you should um, have be able to go a bit above PC and still have this two point connection matrix to find a bounded operator on L2. Um, so, one important piece of context here is that if, if instead of looking at the L2 operator norm, I looked at the L1 operator norm or equivalently the L infinity one, because it's symmetric, um, I get exactly the susceptibility, right? Because the L1 operator norm is like the maximum, well, it's either the row sum or the column sum. I can never remember which, but they're the same because it's symmetric. And that's just the same thing if you write it out as the expected size of the cluster at the origin. So, if you were to define P11, you'd be looking at the supremal value of P where the susceptibility was finite, but that's just equal to PC by the sharpness of the phase transition. So the idea of the conjecture is that in the non-amenable context, you should get a larger critical value if you look at L2 norms instead of L1 norms. Okay, so why is this uh, a good conjecture to start with? Well, one nice thing is that, so I'll tell you why it's a plausible conjecture later, but let's see why it would be interesting to prove it first. So first of all, it easily implies both these two conjectures I already mentioned, so about the non-uniqueness phase and mean field criticality. Why is that? Well, first of all, non-uniqueness is pretty obvious. If you're above PU, if you have an infinite, a unique infinite cluster, then connection probabilities just don't decay, right? And if you have an infinite matrix with like non-decaying entries, it has to be unbounded on L2. So in particular, you know, P22 is always at most PU. So if it's different than PC, PC must be smaller than PU. Okay. Similarly, what about this triangle condition for mean field critical behavior? Well, you know, if you think of this as a matrix, this triangle sum is just cubing the matrix and evaluating it on the diagonal. Right. So in particular, you know, if the matrix has finite norm, then its cube has finite norm and thus has finite entries. Right. So this L2 operator norm condition is like much stronger than the triangle condition, but in particular, it implies that you have this mean field critical behavior. Okay. And of course, you know, as you've probably deduced, really what I prove is on the hyper in hyperbolic graphs, you always have this strong version of the conjecture where the operator norm is finite at PC and a little bit above. And this implies uh, both the things I already mentioned. In fact, there are a few other settings where we can prove the same thing. So one thing is that these perturbative proofs of PC versus PU I mentioned before, they basically always actually imply the stronger conjecture under the same conditions. So for example, this Pack and Smanova and Agnabeda thing really tells you that any non-amenable group has at least one Kelly graph where this strong conjecture is. Um, another setting where we can show it under non perturbative conditions that I don't want to go into in detail is that any transitive graph having a non unimodular transitive subgroup, I'm not going to tell you what that is, but I'll just say that if you take a product of a tree with anything else, it satisfies this condition. 
So in particular, this example of Grimmett and Newman back from 1990, this kind of first paper on the subject where they needed to take their trees to have very large degree. We can now analyze these examples in a completely non-perturbative way and you can do it for any degree of the tree. At least three, right? So it's non-uniform. Okay. Uh, what time am I going to? I uh, four. Okay. So in the last 10 minutes, let me try to tell you a little bit about how I proved this in the hyperbolic case. Obviously, we won't be able to say too much. The first thing is that it turns out that um, similarly to how the susceptibility, the expected cost of size always blows up at least like one over epsilon as you approach PC. The same thing is true for these operator norms. So as you approach P P22 from below, this operator norm has to blow up at least like one over epsilon. Okay, now the proof is really easy, but I'll skip it due to the time. But the important thing about this is that, you know, it seemed like originally if we wanted to prove the conjecture, we needed to prove in particular that this operator norm is finite at PC. But actually we don't really need to show that. It's enough to just show that it doesn't blow up too quickly. And then actually we'll deduce that it's finite because it has to blow up quickly when it approaches the place that it really does blow up. So if we can just show that it blows up slower than one over epsilon, then in fact, we've done it. This epsilon of room is going to be really helpful uh, for the argument. Okay, so back to at least the following strategy. So again, all we need to do is prove that the operator norm of this connection probability matrix blows up slower than one, one over epsilon. So it's natural to split this up into two steps. The first is to look at the L1 norm, which again is just the same thing as the susceptibility, the expected size of the cluster, and show that this blows up at most like one over epsilon. Okay, which again is something we already believe to be true because it's part of this whole conjecture picture of mean field critical way. So at least this ought to be true. Then the second step is to show that if I look at the normalized matrix where I divide by this L1 norm, which again is like the row sum, so I'm just normalizing the rows and columns to sum to one then this normalized matrix should have operator norm tending to zero, okay? And of course, if I prove both of these things, then to estimate this norm, I just multiply these two things together and I get the condition that I want, okay? Now, the nice thing about this point of view is that this normalized matrix is bistochastic, right? As I said, this is just by the definitions, it has row sums and column sums one. So if I like, I can think of it as a transition matrix of a random walk. And as a probabilist, it's nice because estimating things to do with transition probabilities of random walks is something that we like to do. Okay. In particular, there's a nice kind of geometric framework for understanding when these uh, transition matrices of random walks have, um, have norm that's uh, small or close to one or one in terms of a generalization of the Chiga constant that came up earlier in the definition of, of non-immutability. So you know, given the time, I don't want to go into this too much, but basically uh, the outcome of all this theory is that this matrix having small norm is equivalent to something about the isoparametry of sets, but where you're considering the isoparametry in relation to this transition matrix. So it's like if, the boundary of any set is large, um, where the boundary is defined with respect to the transition matrix. Okay. So this kind of brings us to why the conjecture generally is plausible. It's because, well, first of all, this first part of the strategy, that's just something that ought to be true when you have mean field critical behavior, that the one-to-one -one norm blows up like one over epsilon. Now, if you look at this normalized matrix, the denominator is going to infinity as P goes to PC, right? So that means this matrix is becoming very, very spread out as P goes to PC, right? In, in the sense that its entries at each particular place are going to zero. And generically, if we have one of these like non-amenable kind of graphs and we take a very spread out random walk, we kind of expect it to happen that it gets more and more non-amenable, i.e. Like this, this uh, norm goes to zero. Now, of course, you know, for the most natural ways of generating these spread out walks, that's true. Like the most obvious one is just if you take a fixed random walk and then you take powers of it, then it's fine. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not true 
you know, for, it's not true that arbitrary spread out random walks on non immutable groups have small uh, operator norm. So, you know, an example is you just take a product of something non immutable with Z, or you take a copy of Z inside your group, and then you spread out, but like mostly on this copy of Z, like on this amenable substructure that you have inside, inside your space. And there you're not going to get these norms going to zero. So this is actually where we have to use some hyperbolic geometry, uh, which I have five minutes to tell you about. So let's, let's see what we can get through. So first of all, um, you know, the theorem is about these general Gromov hyperbolic graphs, but there's a theorem of Bonk and Tram which says that you can always embed these graphs nicely into like standard finite dimensional hyperbolic spaces in a nice way. So basically, they always look like a convex subset of the of a standard hyperbolic space. So for all your like mental images you have in the proof, you can just imagine you're working in a usual hyperbolic space where I should say, um, what does, uh, I think everyone knows the hy most people who you know, work in math know what a hyperbolic plane is. High dimensional hyperbolic spaces are maybe a bit less, a bit more specialized, but it's basically the same thing. One way of defining it would be you take the upper half of space, but in you know RD, and then you say that the distant, uh, a small line segment um, in in the upper half space has hyperbolic length, which is like its Euclidean length divided by its distance to the boundary. That's roughly how uh, hyperbolic, high dimensional hyperbolic space. Okay. Now it turns out that the analysis of population hyperbolic graphs relies crucially on something that probably seems totally irrelevant. Uh, which is this amazing uh, theorem, although originally called a lemma due to Benjamin and Schramm, which is now commonly called the magic lemma. And what this says is that if you take any finite set of points in RD and you look at the set from the perspective of a uniform random point, so you pick one of these points uniformly at random, and then you, you know, translate and scale the set so that that point's at the origin and the nearest distinct point is at distance one. <clears throat> then what this says is that with high probability, once you look at this point from the perspective, the set from the perspective of a uniform point, it looks like it has at most two accumulation points, one of which is at infinity. So of course, you know, I'm not telling you the exact statement, but you can tell this is kind of some compactness type thing that if you take a subsequential limit that actually has infinitely many points, then it's going to have at most two accumulation points. Well, one of which is so for example you know if you take this kind of uh, exponential cylinder type thing and you take a uniform point in it probably you'll be at one of the middle layers and you'll see a picture like this where you have a, a, a cumulative population point in the plane and one infinity as well if you take a big box then locally from a typical point it just looks like a grid it just has one accumulation point in it. Um, of course, in these examples, it's obviously true, but you know, if you try and construct a counterexample, you'll see like if you you know you take a set that looks like it's accumulating to like a square, but of course, most of the points are near the boundary. So if you pick one uniformly at random, you just see a picture like this. And in fact, you know, you, you, there's no way what the theorem says of setting up the set so that it looks like from the perspective of a typical point, it looks like it's accumulating to more than one point. Now, what's the relevance to this to hyperbolic space? Well, there's also a hyperbolic version of the magic lemma. In fact, you can prove it by taking the Euclidean one and just you know, doing some conversion between like some hyperbolic trigonometry types. Um, but what the hyperbolic one says is if you take any set in hyperbolic space where all the points have at least some constant distance from each other, because we don't want to you know, degenerate down to the Euclidean case, which would happen if we the points are close to each other. Take any well separated set, finite set of points in hyperbolic space, and we do the same kind of thing. So we pick a random point and then view the set from that point. Then, with high probability, the set will look like uh, it's basically that it accumulates to at most two points in the ideal boundary of hyperbolic space. So, another way of saying that would be that most of the volume is in either one or two distant half spaces. So for example, if I take a ball, most of the volume in a hyperbolic ball is near the boundary. So if I look at it from the perspective of a typical point, it will look 
like this, which is like a horrible, it just accumulates to one point in the boundary. If I take this tripod type thing, most of the points are in the tips. And from the perspective of one of these points, I see this kind of little snake tongue type thing where the two of the tripods are really small and in the limit, they just look like they're accumulating to one point and I get two points. Um, so what's the relevance of this to percolation? Well, when you have a percolation cluster, you can always think of the origin as being uniformly random on its own cluster by, by symmetry. So there's a precise way in which you can say that. And so one consequence of the magic climber, although this is actually something you can, this is strictly weaker and you can prove it without the magic climber, it's an older fact, is that, so non-amenability, Right. How was, what was the definition of that? It was that if you take any finite set of vertices, one way of thinking about it is that most of the vertices in the set are near the boundary of the set. Okay. Now, if you have hyperbolic graphs that are non-amenable, they have the stronger property that if I take any finite set of vertices, then most of the points in the set are near the boundary of the convex hull of the set. Okay. And what you can do is you can say, well, that means that when I have a large percolation cluster, the origin is near the boundary of the convex hull of the cluster with high probability. And that means that, you know, doing messing around with some geometry, I can say I can take like two half spaces that are disjoint. And I can say, you know, the probability of a point here having a big cluster is roughly independent of a point here having a big cluster. And then you can do some surgery and get that these, this, uh, this differential inequality, if you want to, that this non intersection constraint on these two clusters is not significant. Um, then, of course, so that, that gives you this first part of the strategy that the susceptibility is blowing up at most like one over epsilon. Then you also have to prove this second part, which is that this operator norm is going to zero. Okay, so just to very briefly tell you how that works, basically using the magic lemma and using this geometric characterization of the operator norms, roughly speaking, what you can show is that when you have one of these very spread out stochastic matrices on a hyperbolic group, the only way for it to not have small operator norm is for it to put most of its mass kind of near a single geodesic. Okay, that's the only way for it not to be have small operator. Norm. This is obviously something very special to hyperbolic space. Um, and then you have to prove that the percolation thing doesn't do this, which is still a difficult thing. Uh, but I'll leave that part of the proof of mystery to you. And then, uh, um, so thank you very much. And there's some interesting uh, questions on the slide.